Reshit is usually one of my favorite parshiot to talk about. There's so much in it. We get to the later books of the Torah. It's difficult sometimes talking about ritual laws, purity, laws of the temple. But the book of Reshit is filled with stories, filled with characters, filled with families, relationships, things that we know we can understand. But all week long, as I looked at the Parsha, I found it very difficult to come up with words. The question we all have is, what do we do now? What comes next? I know it's my job, generally, to answer the questions that people have. But I've been struggling myself with the answers. I'm not so sure that there are answers. I spent this week speaking with members who are deeply troubled, as we all are, by the heinous and violent attack that Hamas carried out one week ago. I've spoken with people young and old who witnessed online the barbarism with which these acts were carried out, these crimes. Witnessed online the evil and the wickedness that still exists in humanity. I've spoken with those struggling because after last weekend, they returned to school or to work to be greeted by a, hope you had a great weekend. Or worse, can you believe what's happening in Palestine? Too many this week have had to live in a world that doesn't understand their pain, that doesn't see their suffering. Because it's not just Israelis. Every Jew around the world is suffering. Every decent person should be. Too many have spent this week surrounded by those who invalidate the tragedy that we as a people suffered last Shabbat. I've spoken with those who've had family in Israel who are worried for a niece, a cousin, a brother, a child who's been called up for reserve duty in the army. And I've spoken and reached out to friends that I haven't connected with in far too long because I saw on Facebook or Instagram their posts that they put on their uniform. They gave up the lives and the families that they've been building in the years since they've been in, been in the army to return to duty to defend their homeland. So we're all asking the same questions this week. Why? How? What now? What do we do now? How do we continue after witnessing what we've seen? After watching so many in the world equivocate, deny our pain this last week, the Jewish right to life. A week later, as I process everything that's happened, I'm not sure I have answers. I'm not sure any answer would ever be satisfactory. Certainly not completely. Hour by hour, day by day, my emotions change. Anger, fear, rage, despair, hate, hope, vengeance, doubt. I've gone through all of these and more. I know many of you have. I felt an outpouring of love from so many within the Jewish community and outside. I've also felt that rage as I hear so many more voices justifying terrorism, justifying murder, justifying the assault of women as acts of freedom fighters, treating Hamas like they're Satan's Maccabees, defending something, standing up for something. This week I found myself crying when I'm alone. Crying at night when I hold my daughter and put her down. Picturing the anguish of so many fathers who won't see their daughters. There's an image I imagine many of you have seen that's been running through my mind again and again since I witnessed it. There's an Israeli father on the news this week telling a reporter that when he learned his daughter was dead, he shouted, yes. And he said this to the reporter with a smile, through tears, through a broken voice. But he was happy because of all the possibilities he could imagine for his eight-year-old daughter, that was the best one he could possibly imagine. What can possibly be said? What can we possibly do now after the week we've had? Our people are no strangers to tragedy or to suffering. So I spent much of this week looking at our sacred texts, turning to books and teachings, 
hoping that in them I could find some answer, some comfort. The rabbi of Gior, he told his fellow residents of the ghetto on the Shabbat Eve before he was sent to Auschwitz, God is not man's sanctuary, but man is God's sanctuary. It's easy for man to retain his humanity in a beautiful home, but let us prove our humanity here in the overcrowded huts too. Here too, we are given a tenth, a twentieth, or a twenty-fifth of a tiny room. We must try to preserve our human dignity. It's a powerful message delivered in one of the darkest times of our people's history. Right before he was deported to Auschwitz. And yet right now, I feel like many of his congregation, I imagine, felt. I find it difficult to try to see any good in humanity. But I'm trying. I'm trying because if in the depths of the horrors of the Shoah, those before me could, how can I not at least try? Traditionally in Jewish law, if someone passes away, they're not supposed to remarry until three festivals have passed. It's the better part of a year. Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot. But the Halakha goes on to teach that if someone who is all alone, they may remarry after only 30 days of mourning. There's another halacha, another law in the books that teaches that if a minion is needed for both a wedding and a funeral, the wedding takes precedence. And similarly, if a wedding procession and a funeral procession cross paths, the wedding procession goes first. Recorded here in law is the central teaching of Jewish theology. The central teaching. Judaism is a religion of life. Judaism is a celebration of life and life sanctity. Marriage, we're taught, is sacred. Because it's from that relationship that children come. And raising a child, our tradition teaches us, is the greatest act of holiness. The greatest sacred thing a person can do. Because in Judaism, a child represents the future. To bring a child into this world is to have faith that despite the sickness, the brokenness of our world, there still exists a possibility of redemption. The lesson from our rabbis in the Talmud, they taught that our ancestors were redeemed in Egypt because of the righteous women of the generation. They tell us in rabbinic legend that the men saw no hope. They looked around with despair at the world they were in, a world of servitude and subjugation. They saw no future and they didn't want to have kids bringing them into a world of pain and misery, a broken world. The men didn't see the point. The legend goes on that the women, they saw the possibility of a future despite the world's present state. And that it was their faith that made what was possible a reality. The murder of children, the celebration of suffering, that's just part of what makes the evil we witnessed last Shabbos so unbearable. The death of a child is to cut off the future. It's what Pharaoh did, casting Jewish babies into the Nile. It's what the Nazis did. Last week, it's what Hamas did. It's a tactic of pure evil meant to destroy the very will of our people to live. The will to rebuild, the will to survive. How do we respond? What meaning can come from devastation? We read in Bereshit how God says the ground calls out with your brother's blood. The ground is soaked with the blood of our future, our children's blood. It cries in anguish with the collective soul of each and every Jew. I often use my pulpit to condemn violence to criticize vengeance and hatred. But it's hard when I feel those emotions. The future demands action. Israel must respond. Not with vengeance, but with justice. Whatever justice can mean in the face of such savagery. To those, and there are too many in our world, who think Israel must sit by, show restraint, that's what they've been doing. That's what they are doing. Even now, the sympathy we found in the world last Saturday is shrinking 
as the death toll in Gaza mounts, as those who paraded in celebration of death now parade their dead for the world's eyes. Israel is not the aggressor. Israel is not attacking the innocent indiscriminately. Hamas is hiding behind the innocent. Hamas are using Palestinian children just as they did ours, as a political tool, as a weapon of warfare. To those who demand Israel stand down, Israel sit by and show restraint, how dare you? How dare you? It's easy to speak of restraint when it's not your future that is on the line. It's easy to speak of lofty values and virtues when it's someone else's children who are being murdered. It's a disgusting act of complicity with the murderers to demand it at a time like this. We have to speak up. We have to demand our right to justice. We have to refuse to let those who call for us to let our people be slaughtered like sheep speak without opposition. I'm part of the Christian Jewish Dialogue of Toronto. I'm on the board of it, and I sat in a meeting last week, one of our regularly scheduled meetings with priests from various denominations, Catholic, Presbyterian, Anglican. And the message the group put together was incredibly powerful. It was really uplifting to come out of Prague last week, and to see in my inbox a message from my interfaith colleague reaching out. But as the week went on, I read the words from their diocese. And I told them at this meeting that the messages from their diocese went from bad to worse. From one on one end of the spectrum, waiting a whole paragraph before starting to justify Hamas's crimes to another that waited just half a sentence. Half a sentence and a comma later before it began to explain the context of the brutal attack. The decades of occupation. These are not freedom fighters. These are murderers. They're not attacking military targets. They are Amalek. Young adults at a music festival, elderly women in their homes, children sleeping in their beds, families hiding together in a shelter. Anyone who defends such crimes is fighting oppression, is complicit in them. So many in our world, they have lost their moral clarity. Even worse, they've lost their humanity. Israel exists because eight decades ago we learned that nobody would help us when the Nazis marched six million to the crematoria. We learned then that the world would stand by when Jewish blood was spilled. That the world could tolerate the torture of the elderly, the abuse of women, the murder of children, as long as they were Jewish. We learned then that we need an Israel because nobody else would ever be there for us. What's so devastating is I knew that existed academically. I've spoken to so many who survived the horrors of the Shoah. But we witnessed a pogrom. We witnessed a day that I never imagined could ever really happen. I couldn't really even understand, despite knowing it happened in the past, how it happened. But we learned again this week that we need Israel. Because for too many in our world, nothing has changed in those 80 years. What comes next? Next comes justice. The destruction of those who try to destroy us. Not vengeance, but preservation. Not a celebration of violence, but a necessary response to evil. We've traded land for peace, thousands of prisoners for a single hostage. We've invested billions of dollars in defensive technology so we could tolerate and not respond to indiscriminate rocket attacks without having to kill the innocent that the guilty hide behind. But we learned this week that it isn't enough. What comes next? Well, I think of the rabbi in the ghetto and his comments that even in the darkest of times, we have to hold on to our humanity. That human beings are the sanctuary in which God lives, not the other way around. That in any response, we have to hold on to our faith. We have to hold on to our traditions. We have to hold on to our values. Because to give them up is to give another victory to our enemies. To allow them to destroy what's kept us together for thousands of years. So what comes next?
We don't let their inhumanity destroy our humanity. We don't give them an extra win by giving up who we are. There's a story of Reb Naftali Trope, who once, when there was an iterant Jew who had visited his city, his town, the man earned a reputation very quickly as a thief. The individual had stolen from all the very people who invited him in to be a guest in their homes while he visited. Word had gotten out that he was a thief, and when he came back to the city in the future, no one invited him. No one would let him come into their homes, except Rev. Naftali Trope. When prominent members of the community heard that the rabbi was putting himself at risk, inviting this thief into his home, they went to him and said, the man you've invited is a thief. Last time he was here, he walked off with the valuables of those who welcomed him. You mustn't allow him to sleep in your home, Rabbi. Rev. Naftali's reaction was simple. So the Torah tells us that a thief must pay a fine for his action. It doesn't tell us that a thief should not be invited to eat or sleep. I have a responsibility to invite guests. If I'm afraid that they might steal, then it's my problem. I must arrange to make sure that my valuables are guarded. My fears cannot relieve me of my responsibility as a Jew to shelter my fellow Jew. What comes next? We hold on to our values. We have to act, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't give them another win. We have to do Jewish. We have to light candles for those who can't. We have to come to shul. We have to give tzedakah. We have to feed the hungry. We have to care for the widow and the orphan. We have to hold the values that have kept us alive. We can't let them take away who we are. What comes next? We rebuild. We support each other. There's a story in the Talmud about Rabbi Akiva traveling on a boat, and it's shipwrecked. One of his colleagues sees the shipwreck out in the sea at a distance and is plunged into grief, fearing that his friend is gone. He's devastated. When the rabbi gets back home to his town, he sees Rabbi Akiva there, sitting and teaching Torah, just as he always did. He's shocked. What happened? Who brought you up from the water? Who brought you up from destruction? Rabbi Akiva says that there was a plank from the ship that floated by him. I clung to it. I held it tight, and I bowed my head with me each wave that came towards me. I held tightly to that plank, and I let it pass. Each of us right now is in that shipwreck. Each of us right now, each and every Jew around the world is lost at sea. But we're also the planks. We have to cling to each other, support each other, help heal each other, help each other move forward. That's what comes next. We support each other as we rebuild. Punctuating the terrible stories that have filled my news feed, I've seen moments of hope. Moments of people coming together. Stories from Israel, stories right here in our community. Last week at the rally, seeing the incredible involvement of our community with the incredible amount of donations that UJA has raised, Sadaka for Israel. Seeing how our communities emptied out Walmarts and Costcos and drugstores and supermarkets, sending supplies and aid. That's what comes next. We help each other. We lift each other up. Our Parsha begins describing the world as chaotic. God was there in a world of tohu vavohu, total chaos. God tried to turn that chaos into order. Each of us, with the divinity inside us, must do that now. Must find our own way to make the chaos in our world, the anger and the hatred, the vengeance, the pain. We must find a way to turn that into something righteous. Turn that into justice. Turn that into an orderly world. One that is fit for our children. The Shabbat, I pray that each of us We'll be strong in our task, strong as a community, and strong as a people as we lift each other up to rebuild. Shabbat Shalom.